Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Let me introduce myself. My name is Roberta, but people often call me Bobby, and my last name is Cordano. I'm president of Gallaudet University, located in Washington, DC. Just a quick reminder, I know this is probably a little bit of a different experience for people here at UNESCO. I am deaf. I use American Sign Language to communicate. It's one of actually 200 sign languages that exist in the world today. I have two interpreters who will be speaking my uh, words into English as I'm having them translated now. I know we have various translations that are happening, some into spoken Spanish, some into spoken English. So if you're listening and need Spanish, my apologies that I don't have the ability to provide translation services into anything except for English. I wanted to begin by thanking Jamal. Jamil, thank you so much for your opportunity that you provided to me to be here to speak today. It's very much appreciated. So I'll be talking about Gallaudet University. This is the title of the presentation. But after I thought about this title a bit, I realized that I understand this is very representative of UNESCO's language, but I wanted to change the title to something more suitable. Gallaudet University is indeed an unintended grand experiment in higher education. And I'll be sharing with you the story as to why we say that's the case. Deaf education existed in America since the 1817 era. And about after 50 years of graduating students from these educational programs, kindergarten through 12th grade, there was a movement in the deaf community to seek higher education beyond that secondary education. And so a proposal was brought to Congress to establish the very first national college for deaf people in the United States. A charter was passed by Congress in 1864, and that charter was signed by none other than Abraham Lincoln. And you see a copy of the Enabling Act, the charter here. And the reason this story is so important is because President Abraham Lincoln, before he was president, was in the Illinois State Legislature in 1939. There was a proposal from a senator, Senator Browning, after Senator Browning had met a gentleman who was deaf on a riverboat on the Mississippi River. I'm just checking to make sure it sounds OK. I hope it is. So what's fascinating about that is Senator Browning met this deaf gentleman on a riverboat and was just so impressed by his ability to be so well educated. And this deaf gentleman explained that he was a product of the Kentucky School for the Deaf, which, by the way, was the first publicly funded school for the deaf in the United States. Senator Browning was so very impressed, thinking if one school could do that in Kentucky, why couldn't they do that in Illinois? So in 1938, they proposed this idea to establish the school. At the same time, Abraham Lincoln was a part of that uh, house in the, the government. So why that's important is because my grandparents graduated from the Illinois School for the Deaf in 1913. Both of them are deaf. Abraham Lincoln then went on to become president of the United States. And of course, during the Civil War, and I should mention again, during the Civil War, this charter to establish Gallaudet University was brought to him for his signature. Abraham Lincoln at that time knew a deaf woman who was the very first Civil War journalist. She worked under a pen name of Howard Glendon. She was deaf. Her name was actually, though, Laura Redden Searing. And she was a very she, personal friend of Abraham Lincoln's. So when the charter was brought to Abraham Lincoln for his signature, of course he signed it. So in 1839, uh, the very first exposure to deaf individuals uh, in the establishment of the Illinois School for the Deaf, and then, of course, in 1864, the establishment of Gallaudet University. This is a very much overlooked fact and a very profound fact that Abraham Lincoln had in terms of his impact. So my parents graduated from Gallaudet University from 1949, one in 1951, the other. In three generations, our family was able to produce the first deaf female president of Gallaudet University, which is myself. That speaks to the power of education, the power of higher education, and I'm a living story to really share with you what can happen when deaf people are educated in America, as we've experienced. I'd like to share with you a very brief video. If you don't know anything about Gallaudet, this will give you a quick uh, glimpse of what we do.
So I'm bringing Gallaudet to you through this video, hoping that you'll get a sense of what it's like to be on our campus. So there are a couple of historically significant events that I think are worthy of my sharing with you to help you understand the experience at Gallaudet and what's important to understand when it comes to people who are deaf and people with disabilities. The first being that it was only in 1960 that researchers at Gallaudet actually were able to discover and verify that sign language, the language used by deaf people, was in fact a bona fide language in and of its own right. And since that time, and again, this is only since 1960, we have discovered over 200 other sign languages around the world used by deaf communities worldwide, including, I'm sure, sign languages from your country in your very backyard. Many colleges and universities around the world know very little about the sign language that are used by deaf people in their own countries. We are currently, as Gallaudet, establishing a micro campus in Nigeria. Nigeria is a country that has a number of different sign languages that are used and recognized. So it's a bit complicated when we think about countries. Sign language is not universal. The second thing we know is that through cognitive educational neuroscience, we've come to understand that learning sign language or any visual language actually adds tremendous benefit to brain development for all children, not just deaf or hard of hearing or deaf blind children. Let me give you an example of what I mean here. Learning a visual language expands your peripheral vision beyond what it otherwise would be which of course we know is critical for a number of skills that you use, whether you're an athlete or just using visual arts or digital media, that expanded enhanced peripheral vision is very helpful, especially even when you're driving. That's why deaf people don't have as many car accidents or rarely have car accidents as other might. We also know that it adds more complexity to brain development and allows for enhanced math computation and better music abilities by having a visual language. Research also shows that when we expose babies to a visual language between the birth, ages of birth and three, deaf, hard of hearing children in particular will not suffer the impact of having language deprivation. And we know that uh, language, emotional and social development can seriously be uh, impacted throughout their lifetime without having language. Research shows that when children don't have that direct access to sign language, particularly deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind children, if they don't have that access before the age of three, they very often suffer significant impacts and are reliant upon government entities. So there are so many other fascinating facts I could share with you. In the United States, we see advancement in education, economics, entrepreneurship, interpreting, teaching of American Sign Language, all of these things create a sign language economy. The sign language economy today is worth two to three billion dollars. So sign language is big business, I can tell you that much. Sign language means jobs, it means opportunities, not just for deaf people, but for people who can hear. And in communities, for children who are able to hear but are born to deaf parents or have siblings who are deaf, the opportunities are broad. Also in the United States, the third most commonly used language in the United States is in fact sign language. It's much more acceptable than it was 100 years ago and it's growing quickly. Take a look at some of this information here. I'll just let you read this content. These are facts that I'm sure most of you here already know. I think that's why you're here. Clearly, you have an interest in addressing the needs of individuals who are disabled or have special needs in the work that you do. So this is not new information, but I can tell you that it's heartbreaking to see just the persistence, the persistence of the failure of providing services so that children can excel or adults with disabilities in educational settings can be successful. I know in many countries, including in the United States, many of the barriers experienced for children and people with disabilities begin right from birth. From the minute that child is born or diagnosed with a disability or hearing loss, what the parents and families face and the fight that they have to engage in to get their children's rights meet, met, it's just tremendously difficult. What I can share with you quickly is uh, one line that I often use, and that is you know, two things that are, I think, very predictive of a child's success if they're born with a disability, is the love from a parent and the exposure to a language. 
that that parent provides to that child. Those are two predictors of that child's success. We can never underestimate the importance of families, and so it's so important that we know that we can provide support and resources to the family to make sure that they're in the right kinds of environment to support their children. So this is the current Gallaudet promise. It's our strategic vision. This is what we go by at Gallaudet, and I'm showing this to you because it's really at the heart of this presentation for UNESCO. We have identified at Gallaudet five grand challenges that we as a university community are working to support the world in solving these problems. We certainly see we can't do this by ourselves, but we invite the world to join us in solving these five grand challenges, not just for people in the United States who are deaf, but for people around the world. These five grand challenges are listed here off to the left, and they lead to three imperatives. These imperatives influence everything we do at our university, and they're located here at the bottom of the screen. With that, that leads to our three priorities at the far end of the screen. As a university, we are committed to delivering these priorities. It's our promise to act to do these things, and it's also the potential that our community has to provide contributions here and to the world globally. Belonging and equity we recognize is at the heart of everything we do. Everything we touch must pertain and persistently support that value. So this quote is one that I really like a lot. If we think about belonging, it's essential to human life, just as water and food are. Be, that are. The need for connection is critical. For me, belonging as a leader really means a couple of things. It creates a values-based narrative that focuses on notions of empathy and well-being, especially as it pertains to others. It helps shed a life on the path forward that then reveals the dominant culture, the dominant structures and attitudes and policies that are already in place. It's with conversations around belonging and values-based narratives that sheds lights on, thing, lights on things that we know have to change. And not only that, belonging goes beyond the classroom experience. If you think about the holistic experience that a student has at our university, it falls both within the classroom and outside of the classroom. And when we talk about uh, what happens in the United States, we've seen a shifting to more of what we call compliance-based cultures as we try to accommodate people with disabilities. In America, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act. In many countries, you have your own legislation that protects the rights of individuals with disabilities. CRPD also speaks to those same initiatives. But what's interesting is they have systems in place that look for people to comply to make the technical requirements necessary to accommodate individuals but we often forget that these people who bring these experiences and knowledge would benefit from engaging in deeper dialogues to better understand what their needs truly are. So this is one of the favorite pictures of mine. I like to use this diagram where it really reflects the notion of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusive excellence. We call this JEDI. For those of you who are Star Wars fans, this probably has meaning to you. I just love the movie myself, so it's kind of nice to use the acronym to represent this concept. The idea of equality is that we give everyone the same thing. Everyone gets exactly the same resources, the same supports, and so that then assumes there's equality. There was a law school dean when I was in law school, um, when I left one of the classes, who approached me afterwards and just noted that I had such an advantage over the other classmates because I had note takers in the class with me, I had interpreters, and what advantages those must be. So I was you know, not getting equal treatment from my peers by having these services. And it's kind of shocking to hear, whereas law school, you know, I struggled that first year of law school, so my response to this teacher was to basically say, you know, I would like to see my classmates try to do four things at the same time. First, try to access the message through an interpreter to make sure I understood what was being shared by the professor. 
And then secondly, beyond that, I also had to make sure I understood the meaning intended by what was being shared. And thirdly, I had to think about my own uh, thoughts regarding what was being shared, and then I have to be prepared to answer a question, should I be called upon? So those are four things every second of the class that was happening simultaneously. For my classmates, they can sit back, take notes, and just be prepared to ask questions they might have. So you know, thing, two things that um, they do were just basically build into, if you see here, the platform that each person is standing on. So that speaks to uh, equality, then moving on to equity. Equity gives people the tools they need. So you could argue giving me note takers and interpreters were uh, attempts to provide me with equity. And that's true. I now have that block, if you will, the stool to stand on so I have a better chance of seeing what's beyond the fence and seeing the actual sunset. The third diagram, I mean the feeling of justice when I could be fully a part of a community, fully engaged with all the support of me and who I am holistically. I think um, I had that experience only once in law school when I was invited to see a presentation by a very well-known individual um, in the United States. And I needed an interpreter the very next day to access that content. I called the Disability Services Office to request interpreting services, and I was told they were on a retreat and the offices were closed. So my classmates rallied behind me. They came together with the dean to let the dean know this was wrong, and they fought on my behalf to make sure I had interpreters the next day. So that's what justice feels like. It's when people break down the walls, tear down the systems to change the views, to change the setting, to provide that sense of justice for all. So I think in almost every country I could say that there are systems that are part of higher education that display bias. They use dominant languages of the world. They're in favor of people who have access to opportunities and networks. And not only that, but these dominant cultures very often favor the achievements of individuals versus individuals as a group, versus that collectivist heritage community that really bases their knowledge of learning in a different kind of context. So I'm emphasizing the word heritage community, which also speaks to indigenous people and indigenous languages. The third part of this, that Jedi notion, forces us to really ask questions as to who has the knowledge that holds value within our system. Who decides if that knowledge has value for the system? So I'd like to share with you next a story. Now uh, let me just leave this image here, understanding we can't have Jedi without belonging and we can't have belonging without Jedi. So I want you to hold that context as I share with you this story. So let me share with you the story. At Gallaudet University, We had a thriving business department on our campus from the 1940s, really uh, well into the 2000s. The business department was thriving. And the business department was building capacity by bringing in individuals, more and more deaf individuals, individuals who could sign, who had master's degrees. And at that time, in the 1950s, it was the first time a deaf person was able to get a doctoral degree in America. This was the 1950s that a deaf person was able to get a doctoral degree. Now imagine how long it takes to build a department if that's the length of time it takes. So people were getting degrees and masters, but not very many people had PhDs in a business. So by the time probably we hit about the early 2000s, the business department was the biggest, most popular department on our campus. And the faculty decided at that time they wanted to go for accreditation. They were very excited to receive this status. They went through all of the necessary requirements to go through that process and move through it very smoothly. The diverse department made up of males and females, uh, faculty members who were deaf, by the time I got to campus was now majority male, majority non-signers or non-fluent in sign language faculty members. In 
you know, 15 years or left, that department dramatically transformed into a department made up of all people who were hearing and not able to communicate through sign language. And as you can imagine, that dramatically impacted enrollment. Enrollment declined, and that's the impact of accreditation because it's really based on the degree attainment of faculty. So we want to make sure that deaf people are, have the opportunity to be able to pursue higher education so that they can hold these positions at universities. So one of the dangers we know of higher education and the narrative that's used globally is this heroic narrative. The expectations of exceptionalism, where I happen to be a great example of exceptionalism and people will look to me and say, you are the exception, but honestly, that really should be our standard. Our standard should be that someone like me is just simply the norm. We need to be able to look to deaf people and see someone such as myself in each one of them. That's how I grew up. My parents and part of the deaf community would look to me and say, you can do anything you want, and they provided me the support necessary to do so. Instead of looking at children to say, wow, how remarkable you are, that's a very different message to a child to say, look all that you've done. You know, you've been able to do certain things and be successful. But instead of doing that, instead to say, we want to see more from you, we want to push you and encourage you to do more, focusing on children's ability to thrive and not just to do heroic acts that we think are wonderful because of their disabilities and because of our lowered expectations. Haman German. Haman German is an Etrian American, deaf-blind individual, Harvard-trained female attorney, said that one of her life goals was to be able to live in a world where her feats aren't heroic. You know, I think I have some key recommendations in summary for all of you in terms of what you can do to create a culture of belonging with JEDI in mind within a higher education environment. First, to incorporate the values of belonging and decision making at every level of your organization. If you think back to our strategic vision that I showed you earlier, it requires the entire organization to think about belonging and equity. Secondly, Pay attention, to what, pay attention to what we call the difference makers in your institutions. These are the individuals who are excelling with student success, and most of the time, especially so with those students who are on the margins. I talk with faculty members who are the most successful with students who are considered to be the most difficult. It's those faculty members who are the most innovative, who are the most commitment, committed, and who are most the amazing individuals. And then that leads to creating the best practices that we can use throughout our university and throughout the world. Next is focusing on building a culture of belonging for all, within all leadership and shared governance groups, including students. I can't emphasize enough that when we talk with our COO and our CFO, we talk about how they can support a sense of belonging within our community. And when we do that, it really shifts our thinking and makes a big difference. Fourth, assure that accreditation standards are fully respecting the experience and knowledge of indigenous and heritage communities and languages. And then finally, this is, I think, what's already happening through the conversations I've seen here at UNESCO, is shifting from being just a single isolated university to a collaborative worldwide university. Gallaudet is the only one of its kind in the entire world, and that's still the case. We feel as though we play an important role in the world stage, but it's not clear exactly how we can collaborate, and I invite you all today to work alongside of us to better understand how we can amplify the power, the talent, the knowledge that each of you have within the deaf, blind, hard of hearing, and deaf individuals in your countries by using what we've learned over the last 157 years at Gallaudet and collaborating with us. These are examples of some of the partnerships we currently have at the university. We're partnering with individuals in Japan. The Japanese School of Social Work is partnering with us. We have our very first ever micro campus that we're building in Nigeria, as mentioned. We have a COIL partnership with individuals in Norway. And you know, I think one of the things that's real important with the way that we approach collaborations, internationally speaking, we ask universities to partner with deaf communities locally.
in their university areas. So they, um, Japan, they partner with the Japanese Association of the Deaf, and the same holds true in other countries. So we come and provide training and leadership and support to grow the local deaf community talent within those uh, political activist organizations so that they can get involved in their universities. We know that representation matters. These last two, I'd like to share with you a video next that I hope you'll enjoy. This video was actually produced by an all-deaf team, and that includes the director, the producer, uh, the storyteller, the videographer, the editor, the uh, cast. Many of the cast members are actually students at Gallaudet. So the entire film that you're about to see was all-deaf produced. When our academic advisor asked us how our semester had been going, we couldn't put it more simply. Allow me to take you back to the beginning of a semester. Home. It can mean many different things to different people. Home can mean many things for us. It is hard when you feel home in an unfamiliar space. And then I saw a sign. Only my heart will believe this, to just find the courage to take the leap. Our fear makes us run the opposite direction, and oftentimes to nowhere. It is up to me to decide how I want to do this. Then this happened. Thank you. Le Pen, I've learned that 
that you can write your own chapter, your own story, your own experience. How can I sum up my experiences? I love my classes. I've made friends I know will be lifelong friends. I found my home at Gallaudet. This place is teaching me to embark on my own journey. Looking back, I do know one thing for sure. I don't know what the next few years will look like, but I know I want to be here. I belong. I belong. I belong. I think that's a great way to close the presentation this afternoon. The main actress just graduated uh, last Friday from the university at uh, Gallaudet. So a couple of those individuals, two of the dancers, also graduated last Friday from the university. So again, these are current active students. Um, the uh, gal here, who was a character in what you just saw, she was uh, screened by, by Marvel, the Marvel Universe, to be one of the characters. She was in the top 12, and now they've asked her to come back. So she's advancing, and I wouldn't be surprised to see her in Hollywood some point in time over the next couple of years. So she's on her way. But let me ask if you have any questions, anything I can answer for you. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. Um, very inspiring. Uh, my name is Hulberg Schervan, and I work for the Norwegian Development Corporation, and we partner with universities in the global south, which I learned yesterday, I'm not allowed to say, but in lack of other words. Um, I was wondering if you could share some, because I, I, I realized that you have some uh, collaborations in Nigeria, but can you, because of course, in a low resource setting, how to, um, how, how to uh, create the best inclusion and equity in a low resource setting, because of course, obviously, this is a more resourced setting that you are coming from. So I don't know if you have any thoughts, experiences, where to start, etc. Sure. Well, first, I wanted to tell you something about Norway. I think this is important for all of you here. The very first exchange student at Gallaudet was from Norway, and I think it was 1898. And uh, it was just then, 2021, now we have the first deaf female tenured faculty member at Oslo Met in Norway. And uh, she actually came to the United States for high school as an exchange student. She came to Gallaudet for a brief time, I think for uh, part of her college education. She got her PhD in Norway and now she is a fully tenured professor there. So I am actively supporting her and her faculty leadership since uh, she began her work there. I was in Norway a couple of years ago and that we parkered, partnered with Oslo Net, met for some online programs through the COIL network. But it just speaks to the power of what's happening even in your own country, if and you're not aware of it, but now we're seeing more advancement of deaf individuals in the higher education system. Now, back to what we were doing in Nigeria. And I think part of our work is why we committed, as I did earlier on in my presidency, to do this work in other countries like Nigeria. There was a businessman from Nigeria who came uh, to America because his cousin, who was a dean that was promoted during my tenure, the dean of the business school um, and professional studies, this was this hearing gentleman's cousin, but the dean was the first black male to be a fully profess tenured professor at Gallaudet. He was the first black deaf man to become dean at the university, but he was uh, born in Nigeria, created a pipeline of students from Nigeria to Gallaudet. Um, and in the film, you also saw the dean of faculty who was also born in Nigeria. So one of the things that I begun, begin to see is that we are having a number of Nigerians be successful at Gallaudet, and they've now created a pipeline for other Nigerian deaf individuals to come to Gallaudet and benefit from. So what I've noticed is that when countries provide access to their deaf citizens to come to Gallaudet, to be educated there, they're able to grow and thrive in this setting. But then what often happens is that, in this case, in fact, um, this, this cousin of this deaf gentleman, 
he realized his cousin came to Gallaudet, got educated, but never returned back. And that's the case for very often with deaf students. They cannot get a job. And so, I mean, we just heard from the gentleman from Tunisia saying one out of three individuals who get a college degree don't find a job. And imagine if the person was dis disabled. It's very challenging for deaf people to find jobs in their home country. So we're trying to build the stories about what's been happening to create more pipelines to the United States. Uh, Sir Damola from Nigeria had two cousins. Uh, he uh, had one, Do Dr. Isaac Egbola, who passed away at the age of 61, unfortunately. That's what brought his cousin, Sir Damola, to the United States for the funeral. But the cousin, uh, Dean Isaac Egbola, moved up through the Gallaudet system, was very successful, and they together supported the other deaf cousin who was in Nigeria, who was never educated, had no access to anything beyond eighth grade education. So one of the things we find that's happening is that we're working with the National Associations of the Deaf in Nigeria to provide leadership training. And we have decided that the project, project first was to establish a micro campus, but then we came to realize as government leaders came to Gallaudet, we need to start from scratch and start from the very beginning. We're now focusing on providing some basic credentialing opportunities to give individuals who are deaf the skills to be able to work and seek employment currently. We're also focusing on working with the governments to build and strengthen the birth through 21 pipeline, the educational programs for those children. We've had ministers of education come to Gallaudet. I'm also responsible, by the way, for our uh, birth through 21 programs on our campus. But as the ministers, government ministers, come to Gallaudet, they get an understanding of the importance of early access to language and um, the importance that that has on the child. So we need the government's involvement to help write policies. USAID just gave us a $2.4 million uh, funding project to support the work we're doing, engaging USAID in this work. I also went to Finland, uh, Norway, just about a month or two ago. And my visit there was because many leaders who were in Finland in particular were very involved in what was happening in Nigeria and other countries. So we're building the deaf community network to build and strengthen the local deaf communities. And in doing so, I think one of the things we want to do is, is work locally, find solutions locally, bring resources to be able to provide that training internally so that we can build from that, because that can sustain the work and the success in Nigeria and other places. We're hoping that Nigeria will serve the region, just as Gallaudet serves the region of individuals coming from the United States and Canada. But we want to do the same kind of thing now in Africa. We picked Nigeria simply because of the ties that they've had to Gallaudet for a number of years. But um, I think it starts from within the country. You know, I understand there are low resource communities. It's very difficult to find ways. But if you find committed deaf communities, there are some communities of individuals with disabilities who will join forces. Um, you know, for sure, we want to look to the deaf communities to see if you can build strong deaf communities. Other people with disabilities also benefit from the resources and initiatives. So I, I do see that um, from the lens of having, you know, rich resources and having the ability to do what we do, but we can also, you know, support and collaborate with others. We have individuals who, let's say, from Nigeria can come and provide presentations, who can help provide resources to other countries, and uh, then increase, you know, global uh, collaboration. So we want to do more. We're working with the Finnish community at the Deaf Club. The Finnish government to see, um, for them to see what's happening in Nigeria to build. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's challenging. It's challenging, no question about that. Okay, let me go here first. And Jamil, yeah, I think the guy in the back had his hand up first. So, but go ahead, Jamil. Thank you very much, Bobby, for this very inspiring presentation. The very the moving video at the. At the end, and I would like to build on your response to this first question, um, you, you insisted on the importance of respecting, recognizing different knowledge, uh, traditions, and communities, and ways of looking at the world and, and, and learning. Um, as you go in, to other countries, especially countries in the Global. We had this conversation about the global south, but countries that have less resources and perhaps more needs. Have you find that when you interact with the deaf community or the institutions with uh, who are starting something similar, 
in these countries that they have different ways of doing things from which you might learn or you found that, oh, that's a good way that could be useful to transform uh, Gallaudet University and to work better towards our five um, challenges. Right, so, you know, maybe I can respond by sharing with you a story about what I learned from the deaf community and my own personal upbringing. I grew up in a community in the middle of the United States, and what's interesting there is that there were a number of people who were deaf, who were very well educated, my parents being among them. And one of the things that my parents emphasized with me and our deaf community, really nationwide, this is true, for if we, we have a degree and we are well educated, we can really bring others along with us. I guess the better way to say it, we, we can, um, you know, rising tides lifts all boats. We can share knowledge and information, work together, learn together, and that elevates learning for everybody when doing so. So it is about building a culture of learning and exchanging of information and knowledge that makes things possible for the entire community to be able to access higher education over time. Nigeria is a great example. We started with entrepreneurs in the farming markets the market that existed there, to understand how we can help support their businesses, to grow their businesses so that they're thriving. If we teach the basic skills that are necessary there, they can then share that wealth to and educate other members of the community. And to your question, yes, in fact, I do travel a lot, and in that I see uh, much learning. I think one of the important things to share here is that in America and in many European countries, health care has, um, has has been corrupted by many medical industries who feel that signing is not necessary for people who are deaf. Of course, that does not uh, replicate what our brain research is showing. Our research shows is that uh, you know learning to sign can benefit every single person. I mean, think about it. Even in this room, probably almost all of you are likely to have some kind of a hearing loss by the time you hit 65 years old. The World Health Organization that says 20% of the world will be deaf by the year 2050. So sign language is a basic compensatory skill that you're going to use over your lifetime. In fact, there are villages in Israel and I think another one in Brazil where only 3% of the population in that community are deaf, only 3% and yet the entire community knows sign language. They don't leave a single person behind. In fact, they're able to navigate between the spoken language and the sign language. If a deaf person leaves the conversation where everyone had been signing, the people who are hearing continue to sign, even when there aren't deaf people in these areas. So these villages are places that we can learn so much from. They have the most powerful teaching for me, and I think belonging comes from our ability to learn from others. We did have a, a community very similar to that in the United States. It was called Martha's Vineyard in the mid-1900s. It uh, dramatically changed. But we have been listening too much to healthcare providers telling us that sign language is not necessary. Spoken languages are far more important over sign languages, and that's not true. But we know that still in developing countries, deaf people are continuing to create sign languages around the world. We, in fact, as deaf people, are the only people creating new languages around the world. People who are here, your spoke, hearing, your spoken languages are no longer being uh, created. Your, your ability to create spoken languages has stopped, but sign languages and the creation of sign languages have not stopped. So in these villages, they really look to mutually support one another. That's a driving value for them, looking to the needs of others. So yes, we have a lot to learn from these communities. And much of my thinking about belonging comes from those communities. That's the kind of world I want. And we can look to these small villages, I think, that have those uh, values represented. Yes, there in the back. Hi, my name is Cheng, and uh, I am a primary school teacher here in, in Spain. And you have given some recommendation to to create this uh, um, culture or atmosphere of belonging in in the higher education. And I'd like to know if uh, there's anything else we need to well, primary school teachers need to know to create this atmosphere in 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 our classrooms. Sure. Thank you for that question. You know, one of the things that, you know, any time you come across a child who is deaf, hard of hearing, or deaf blind in your school and in primary schools, one of the first thing that's important to do is to make sure that that school is offering sign language to every single student, staff, teacher, and administrator in that school. 
you know, whenever there is one single child who needs access to a visual language, your school should be providing it at all levels. Because that ensures that that deaf or hard of hearing child can engage and play in the playground with their peers or in the gym or in the classroom and theater, wherever they are. And you know what I can tell you is that for many schools, they'll just provide an interpreter for that deaf student in the classroom. But do you know how many times you have conversations with your classmates as they're seated beside you? So a deaf child who watches the interpreter all day doesn't have the opportunity to engage with their peers. You know, everyone knows when we're not watching the interpreter, so we get easily uh, scolded if we're not paying attention to the interpreter. So unfortunately, our experiences are stunted by having an interpreter in the classroom, but of course, interpreters also don't go out to the playground. So if the deaf child's on the playground, if they don't get picked or they do get picked, how do they communicate with their classmates or with their teammates? They get excluded, they get left out, and the number of uh, concerns and problems just escalate. So that's why we want to put deaf children in schools where signing is available to them everywhere. And I'm advocating for countries to really do an analysis of bilingual teaching environments for deaf children and to really understand that children who grow up with the ability to hear but have deaf parents, um, their native language is sign language of that region. So they can also benefit from these uh, signing environments. I do think that in the um, countries outside of the United States and Europe, countries like Africa, South America, parts of Asia, that's where we see the most opportunity for innovation based on the languages that exist there. You know, we just have far too many healthcare providers with biases um, in the Western world that heavily influences, you know, medical devices or influenced by medical devices. And I think it's a bit controversial that I'm controversial that I'm saying that. I could be unpopular because I do know that this is being streamed, so this might cause issues, but I think it would be important to um, really engage individuals who are deaf, deaf blind and hard of hearing to help understand their experiences and from them to uh, grow our knowledge about people with disabilities. So I would suggest bringing signing and gesturing into the school at all levels. One thing I can share is that every single human being has 200 innate gestures that are a part of who they are. You know, the gesture that tells us the most information is just by pointing. I saw somebody kind of give me the time's up uh, gesture to indicate to me my time is up. There are so many gestures that can communicate a wealth of information. Okay, well, one more question, and I um, think we need to it wrap it up. It has to be the last question, okay? Absolutely, one more question. Uh, I'm from Brazil, uh, from, yeah, and my, my university has an interesting program of Libras. Libras is the name of uh, the Brazilian language, is Bra the Brazilian sign language in Portuguese, Libras. And, uh, but I want to mention something else. Uh, you, you mentioned Lincoln at the beginning. And uh, in, when I was in grad school in Berkeley, I saw the bust of Lincoln there because Berkeley is a land grant university. And, mm -hmm. But I didn't know that Lincoln also signed this. And it, it's amazing. So every university in the world should have a Lincoln bust somewhere. <laughs> right? Oh, and absolutely. I it's agree it's with incredible you how Lincoln uh, was so important. And uh, Thank you for your exposition there and talk. It's really inspiring. Thank you. Sure, and two things just to share with you. One, I can say there is, um, in Brazil, an enclave, I think of, I would say probably several dozen, if not close to 100 deaf people who have gotten uh, doctoral degrees in field related to um, deafness with deaf education or interpreting. So it's amazing what's happening in Brazil. I'm very curious to learn more about how we can further grow that kind of work outside of the fields of deaf education and interpreting, like in areas of mental health, social work, counseling, and other fields that we also offer at Gallaudet. I think Brazil is just a ripe area for innovation as we could perhaps partner with Gallaudet. You know, if you can help make connections for us to do that, I would be very interested. We also have a faculty member who has a collaboration, a trilingual collaboration to provide trilingual um, learning in 
uh, different spoken languages, sign languages as well. So it'd be wonderful to build on that partnership. And to Abraham Lincoln, I would encourage you, you know, one phrase that he was very well known for, he and Senator Morrill really uh, led the United States Congress, um, and together they all believed in this notion that education was the key to the fair chance of the race of life. And they used that phrase repeatedly. So if you want to have the chair a fair chance of the race of life, you have to be educated. And really, you know, speaking to that notion is something that was important to them. They didn't talk about the need for resources, financial or otherwise. They really believed that in order to elevate the people who were in rural parts of the United States, as they were concerned about their education, people living in rural communities, how could they access education? Land grant legislation was a way to make that happen once it passed. I think it was in the 1800s or shortly after the Civil War, or rather right before the Civil War, I think it was. But what's interesting is that those universities were to admit individuals who were African American, and they didn't. So Congress went back and then set up separate funding for universities like Howard University, which is another uh, model, an HBCU in the United States. And then after that, uh, land grant money was used then to support other HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities in the United States. But yes, absolutely, it's that commitment from the government, and it's our job to do that very thing. You know, in higher education and primary education, we have to talk about this. We have to go out, be citizens of the world, and ensuring that our students do are as well, and that we have conversations like this. And it's led us to where we are right now. And thank you all very much. Thank you so much for your attention and for being here.